What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Student Built Startups Podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Stone, entrepreneur and recent grad from the University of Minnesota Duluth. I interview young entrepreneurs to share their stories and business strategies. Now, today's guest will talk about management and leadership in the party and card games industry, as well as how he's developing his game called Mucho, which he will explain during the episode. I encourage you to go check out his social media at mucho.game to find out more after the episode. I am absolutely thrilled to be having the co-game designer and illustrator of Mucho, Shama Yaya, on the SBS podcast today. Shama, um, I'll have you start off by saying hello to everyone listening and sharing one crazy but true fact about yourself. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, yeah, my name is Shama Yahya. And uh, I guess one crazy fact about me is that I was once a model. How about that? Whoa. <laughs> a model. What kind of model was that? Like, you know, like, uh, runway, like, you know. Run- okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. How did you like that? I mean, it was nice. I mean, you know, I got paid pretty decent for like putting on one outfit. And um, yeah, you know, I got, I got all the nice pictures and stuff like that. <laughs> That's That sounds like it'd be kind of a cool gig to do for a while. You know, you get some some probably really good photos that you can hang on for a while. And uh, exactly like, it's gotta be a good, uh, interesting experience. And, and so everybody wants to wear the outfit you're wearing, but don't ever wear it. Most of your friends <laughs> have like bragging rights. So yeah. Yeah. Well, that's very cool. Um, I guess we can kind of start off by giving everybody kind of a brief overview of like who you are. So maybe just share a little bit about your background, um, such as like, where you're from, your education, and kind of where your entrepreneurial ambitions started. Sweet, sweet. Thank you. Um, so I was born and raised in um, Kigali, Rwanda, which is in East Africa. Uh, and uh, yeah, I spent most of my life there, um, high school, all that stuff. I actually came to the U.S., uh, I believe it was 2019 in August. I came um, um, to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And um, majoring uh, in integrated science with a focus in ag communication and environmental science. So that's what I've been doing for the past two years. Um, and a little bit about my background, you know, back home in Rwanda was uh, I was a kid who was mostly into sports. So I always had a little of a competitive edge. You know, I played basketball and uh, I just loved winning and the process, um, how to get better, all that type of stuff. Um, but when I graduated from high school, I actually took a gap year and in that gap year, I just was um, doing a lot of researching of things that I find interesting aside from sports. Um, and I started going into NGOs and I started helping out with a lot of, um, initiatives to help children develop kind of like leadership thinking and, um, entrepreneurship thinking. And I kind of just kind of, that's when I started to dive into, holding on to projects and starting to create them and stuff like that. And so from there, I think it's when I realized that I had a thing for like connecting people and helping societies and being more of a social entrepreneur. And so I came to the U S with that idea of just loving to connect people. And so when, when, when I got the chance to um, play a bunch of board games because back home I didn't play a bunch of board games I just kind of fell in love with the ability to con- how to connect people and um, the ability to create communities through games and so th- that's kind of how I got into I guess what we're going to talk about today but that's a little of a short yeah yeah, yeah I, I, I can kind of see the common connections there because you, you you know you're talking about you're very into sports and like that's like a competitive thing and then entrepreneurship has a lot of similarities to sports and yeah. then board games are also kind of a competitive thing, depending on who you're who you're playing with. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm I'm really excited to hear about this board game. Uh, I'm hope I pronounce it correctly. Is it Muko? Is that how you say it, or is it Muko? It's Mucho. Mucho. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, yeah. how about share a little bit about uh, Mucho? Kind of what you've been doing to get it started and uh, creating it, and then also like what's the basis of it and what plans you have. Sweet. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, like I said, um, this all started, maybe I can go back from the beginning where it all started. I was just visiting uh, at the time, uh, people, my host family, you know, people, you know, um, visiting them and we had like dinner and, you know, just kind of hanging out. Obviously, we all didn't know each other that well, so it was kind of awkward and 
you know, the kids are just quiet and shy and then you just kind of feel like, you know, it's a very weird situation. And then they bring out all these games and just to give a bit more context, like I said, back home, it's more of just like the basketball, football, like those really active sports is what you people engage in in their free time as opposed to like board games. Um, so when I saw that, you know, and we played like one game, which is my favorite game, it's called Exploding Kittens. So, yeah, we played that game and I was like, what? This is insane. And then, you know, everybody was friends and, you know, we're all laughing and stuff like that. And then um, at that time, I think like two months prior to that, you know, due to my major and what I study, I was looking into how can we talk about the environment and wildlife protection in a way that people can actually, you know, support it. And also because I'd worked in NGOs, I knew that it was hard to really, get people to care about such stuff. And so when I saw the opportunity to make a game, I just connected everything I study with my experience. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to make a game based off gorillas because back home, we really care about conserving our, our gorillas. Um, I was, I'm going to make a game about gorillas and everyone is going to play it and they're going to try to protect gorillas in this game. And if the game is good enough, we'll get enough traffic on our websites and we can connect with NGOs and we can be able to save some wildlife while doing it. Sounds um, like you, oh, go ahead. It sounds like you put a lot of thought into it. I mean, like, uh, you know, kind of cross breeding these different areas that you have interest and in, expertise and kind of social goodwill. I think it's a really, really uh, innovative, cool idea. Um, yeah. Sorry to cut you off there. <laughs> And it's fine. Yeah, so that's really how it started. And the, the fun thing was, like I said, I was in this phase of just really trying to figure myself out in terms of what I want to do because I had figured out at the time that I, I enjoy telling stories. And at the time, I was really looking into, like, animation and, you know, all these different um, platforms. But all of them were just, like, so hard for me to get in, like, and do something really quick because, like I said, I had this spirit of, getting things done, being competitive, having something finished, looking at it just made me feel happy. And so, I, you know, I tricked myself. I was like, I think if I make a game to probably be very fast. Um, so that did not, that was like, what, I think a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's just the background of the whole um, project. And so essentially what happened is um, the Mucho game, um, uh, I got two of my friends who are core game designers on it. I told them, hey, I have this idea. This is how it works. I think it's going to work. Let's just sit down and do something. And so essentially, we created this game where basically everyone is given what we call a, a mutual family. This is kind of like assets or tokens. Um, and in this mutual family, you have what we call the real muchos and the fake muchos. And essentially using playing cards, which are given to players, everyone is trying to grow their family before everyone else. So you're trying to like protect your assets and like grow them as well, or like get more if you will. And there's obviously like a certain number you need to reach to win the game. And so it's really like a very competitive environment where you're trying to like grow and protect. And so there's a lot of like plot twists and stuff like that. Um, so that's just how the game works and operates at a really short summer I can give if you will. Um, and what we're trying to do with it, essentially, obviously, we're planning to release the game in August. We're going to um, release the game on the Game Crafter. Um, but really, our long-term vision is that it can be a game that can um, be able to create traffic and raise discussions that are really important about wildlife and um, how we go about um, protecting our environment and stuff like that. So hopefully, we can be able to create these platforms for conversations between our um, customers and just um, other people generally um, through games. Yeah, it's, it sounds like you have a really, really good kind of uh, reasoning behind it. And I, I'm a huge fan of board games. Like I've always, I've always enjoyed like card games and board games and that kind of stuff. And like the other weekend I was playing a board game with some of my family members. I'm like, it's crazy how just a deck of cards can like turn a gathering of people into like people laughing and having a good time and that kind of stuff and it sounds like this game you're making is actually going to be pretty pretty fun and interesting and uh i want to hear more like once it's released i want you to make sure to reach out to me because i definitely want to look at it and uh i mean depending on how it looks i might actually buy buy it there i mean <laughs> it, uh, it sounds pretty fun 
Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, like you said, you know, um, that that was a driving force um, uh, that built to connect people. And so that's really the, how the whole game was made. And that's why it took long to make the game because most games don't take so long to make. Mm-hmm. But um, it was like, how do we create something that is innovative, um, but still has the goal to connect people? So sometimes the cards were just like, you know what, this card is not really connecting and it's really pointless we're moving that card and we're like oh we need some more interaction how do we make the game mechanics work to do that and so we really um really cared about making sure that this game is something that um people can sit down and maybe you know three weeks down the line can be like remember no playing much when you did this to me and that's really what we wanted and so it was really we took a really an, a serious approach on every single detail about it and on top of that, this was, um, we wanted to make it a very culturally, um, if you will, how do I say, very oriented in terms of like sharing some different elements of the culture. And so what, what is on each card, for instance, there's like a word in English and there's a word in Kenya Rwanda, which is the, the mother tongue in Rwanda. So that's like, I think there's no other card that does that. There's usually just like one name on, on a card. But for instance, like skip in, in, in English, there's a word for skip in Kenya Rwanda, and you kind of put it on the sides. So whenever you're playing the game, you can say whatever you want and it still makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, cool. So all those little things made, made the game, but it takes so long. And as well as with students, we can't really work on this 24-7, even if we wanted to. Um, so, yeah. I You know, I, the more I think about it, like... Uh, it intrigues me because I almost feel like having that kind of cross-cultural aspect will be a really positive, like driving force. Cause I, I think that like people like kind of experiencing some new culture and even if it's just words from a different language on a card. Um, I think that's an interesting aspect that you, uh, included in there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to stray just a little bit from what we had planned, but I'm curious that like when you're developing a game, like, what where do you like i know you have like an idea and you start with that like when you're actually like making like the game and the rules like where do you start with all that stuff that goes into it yeah so the rule of thumb is that you just kind of have to go play a bunch of games and (laughs) be inspired that is the number one rule (laughs) okay so so we went on like a spring and just played a bunch of games that we didn't even probably like but we just tried them out Mm -hmm. and we were just kind of trying to see what what works for us, what makes us excited um, to play games. And then from there, that would be like a fuel for inspiration and, and um, ideation. So there's always that element. And so for me, the games that I really played that I liked a lot, I talked about Exploding Kittens. There's another game called Avalon. Um, they had a way of um, taking the excitement away from the game and put it on the people. So now it's no longer the game that is exciting. It's seeing people's reactions and people's, you know, all of a sudden becoming these crazy characters because the game requires you to be this person to win. And so we figured out that while we, while we don't know what every card will look like, we know what we want the people to be like in the game. And so that's how we developed the game, kind of with that mindset. So whenever we tested the game and... There was more focus on the cards and the players. We just said we're doing something wrong. And then we'll just kind of go back and change a few cards. Not everything, of course. The goal was still the same. It was always about a gorilla family and protecting it. But how that changes over the course of the time was very, you know, was very interesting. Um, so it, it, it's, you know, it's starting with what you want out of the game. And then you, you can create from there. Yeah. Oh that actually connected a lot of dots for me. Like it makes a lot more sense now because so that game that I played a couple of weeks ago was, uh, it was exploding kittens and it makes sense. Like that game, like the focus is on the people. Like if you were just focused on the cards, it would be kind of boring. I mean, not, <laughs> but I mean, yeah. it, it has elements to it that, that bring the excitement out of the cards. Um, but also like today I learned how to play uh, Yu-Gi-Oh cards for the first time. Wow. And that was like a very analytical, like, yeah, uh not much like yeah it was was all in the cards and it's a very different experience so i really understand kind of what you were saying there so yep um so how many people like are working on this this game development process with you 
So we were four, if you count me, and then there's other two uh, core game designers who worked on that. And then there's another uh, illustrator. So I do the game design and illustration, and he also helps the illustration. He has done, he has made a really beautiful box design and um, some other ending elements. Um, and also we work together in like making videos, like how to play video. Um, so we get to share both of our skills between me and the other um, game, no, sorry, yeah, il- illustrator. He's called um, Venimana Atali. And then the core game designers, one is called Samuel Ranjira and the other is called Matthew Sankar. So they worked in, we worked on it in different phases. Um, I worked on it the whole project, but they worked on it in different parts. Um, so that's how we kind of work together. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so what have you kind of learned from like, yeah, we're going to kind of switch over to like more of like entrepreneurial type uh, talk mm-hmm. now, but like, what have you kind of learned from this, this process as far as like kind of leading um, and kind of uh, being like a center point of a project development? You, there's so much that you never know until you enter into any project. Do you think you know a lot until you step into it? <laughs> <laughs> And you kind of realize that, you know, you're like, you had no idea what you're doing. <laughs> so I think for me, I mean, starting from the day one, we, we, I obviously knew that I didn't know what I was doing because I was just beginning to learn how to illustrate. I had never played much games in my whole life. Um, this is what my first game, business, if you will. Um, so there was a lot of learning to do. <laughs> so... I think the question was what I've learned, right, during that process. Yeah, yeah. Like, what have you learned that's, like, important when you're trying to lead a project development process or yeah. that sort of thing? So I think one of the main things is that as a leader, you need to give yourself time to grow. Like, you need to schedule, um, be a day or maybe a few hours to kind of pick up some skills. Because if you're not growing, your team will not grow. And um, so I think when you're starting a business, there's always a lot of demand on you, obviously. There's a high demand on you, but I think um, in reality, if you're able to just kind of spare some time and figure out, okay, I need to learn this because if I don't, my team has nothing. Um, so that's always one of the most important things. And uh, the second thing for me was, because this was a very creative industry-based business, the ability to um, set expectations, but also stay optimistic in a sense, like, um, we had all these goals, like we need to do this by then, publish by then, you know, get to the market, do some marketing by then. That is really good. It's nice to be optimistic and have some goals, but sometimes you don't really meet that. And you need to be able to communicate to the team when such doesn't happen. So you need to be a good communicator. You need to um, really not be so emotionally attached to everything because um, expectations sometimes not always, you know, it doesn't always work out the way you think it will. Uh, and that, that in, in, in many ways in a creative business, that's what will happen. So as you walk into the business, you need to be optimistic, but don't be discouraged if you don't meet certain deadlines. And I think um, some of the people I really read the books were really were like, we run like Disney and other big creative industries. They always talk about, they don't let, the pressure of deadlines force them to push their creative people to do something that's horrible. And I agree with that. Like in the early phases, you're under pressure of trying to finish things as quickly as you can, but you cannot lose the big picture, which is uh, obviously creating something that is of value and that is of quality. So uh, yeah, being able to be a good communicator, not losing the side of the big picture those are things that you need to always remember in the early phases more than ever. Yeah. 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 Um, both of those really resonated with me, but the second one there um, really like, I, I really kind of understand what you're, you're talking about because like, I think there's a fine line between setting expectations, you know, and like goals and like uh, objectives and like, mm-hmm. it, it's like a very like hard to find, like, where do I go as far as like trying to meet those, uh, you know, objectives and deadlines and goals uh, versus like you know maximizing our like uh, 
perfectionism, you know, Um, because if you go too far to the perfectionism side, you end up never getting something done. But like if you try to rush everything right away, like it's very likely going to (laughs) suck. So it's a really challenging thing to do, even by like by yourself, like as an individual. But when you have multiple people working on something, I could only imagine how that adds a whole nother level of uh complexity to that situation yeah for sure it definitely does because everyone has a has a share in what you're saying and you know you feel the need that everyone should be asked what to do or not to do but you know especially when you are trying to reach a deadline you kind of have to be as a leader you need to really be honest and have that trust of gut if you will and kind of look at it and be like well is this really what we want to put out there in the world and then, you know, when you feel like, you know, the answer is no, as as much as it sucks, you just have to accept it and kind of come back at the table and um, figure out what's missing. And, you know, that's the entrepreneurship process. You know, that, that's the whole yeah. that's the whole thing, you know. Yeah, it is. And uh, it's crazy how entrepreneurship fits itself into so many different areas and categories and, you know, industries, I guess, because like. People, a lot of people think of entrepreneurship as like marketing agency. Like that's a lot of people think of entrepreneurship as that, but like you could be an artist and also be like an entrepreneur in a sense. Oh, like sure. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's weird how like sometimes things are boxed in like that, but um, that's why I love interviewing people like you who are doing things outside of the typical uh, quote entrepreneurship stuff. Cause like, like board game stuff is super fun. And also it's like super entrepreneurial. There's so many like creative aspects and then the business planning and marketing. Um, yeah. So I agree with you. Um, I guess one thing I'm really, I love to ask my guests is like out of like their business development or product development process, like what is like one of the mistakes that you learned the most from making? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, <laughs> we all do. <laughs> you know, yeah, I've really been thinking about that a lot lately. Like somebody asked me that, I don't know, like, what do I say? Like, what are the biggest mistakes that um, have come up? And I think for me, when I really think about it deeply, I think it's about really, you need to be self-aware of who you are. Because um, when you step into business, um, th- there's like some high like some high demanding things will come out of business and you need to know who you are who are you in tough situations you know and that is different for everyone um you know for me one of the biggest issues i had i like to solve things really quickly like i want to get things out of the way as fast as i can you know and now what that means in business is that sometimes i'll not do my research on maybe i'll not look at the numbers very well before Let's say I purchase a few um, card stock for p- testing cards or whatever. And maybe if I really looked at the numbers better, I would have found a better deal, uh, you know, across the street or something, you know, something like that. Yeah. Um, so for me, that was my biggest issue was uh, I, I sometimes ignored who I was in business because, I, you know, me in business, I have my own weaknesses as a person and I need to be very aware of that because, once you go into business, a lot of things, um, you you influence a lot of things. You influence your budget, how you use your budget, um, maybe how you talk to your colleagues, you know, um, maybe sometimes, like I said, coming from a sports um, background, you know, tough love is just all I ever knew. So, like, sometimes you have to be very loving and, you know, and that's something that I, I had to train myself and kind of be very, you know, like, hey, you know, keep at it, you know, and be this inspirational guy um, as opposed to be like, come on, you can do better. You know, <laughs> you know, there's a, so there's a high need, I think, for any business person. To, you need to know who you are. And because once you know who you are, it's like uh, it really helps you to, to avoid a lot of traps. Um, so that's the first thing for me. That's the first mistake I did. Um, and then I think the second mistake for me that I did was um trying to do business trying to run a business looking at like one aspect of it only for instance if i'm creating a product i can't ignore the funding element like some of the times you know my strategy was like let me just do this product once it's done the money will come that's not always how it works you know you have to be able to balance things out for instance 
if you're like a student, as most school states podcasts are, what are the funding opportunities around you? You have to always be able to like keep an eye out on the different parts of your business so that um, when you need the money, for instance, because this is a really, it's a common error most people do is like they think once I make this product, you know, I'll be able to find the money. But then that puts in a situation where it goes like, okay, now I need the money. Where's the money? It's not there. So you need to um, plan in ahead and try to just like go to different competitions. If it requires you to take a month preparing, okay, that's a good deal. Just, you know, take some time off and balance out between your product development and your funding search and your marketing plan. So you need to kind of grow the business together. You know, don't leave one aspect out of it because um, by the time you look back and you have not developed all the aspects together, there's like one, like, let's say, for instance, marketing is like three months behind and, you know, and that's a really bad mistake. So you need to be aware of that and, you know, be on top of everything. You have to really understand your business model. And I think for me, it took me a while to understand, you know, my business model. Um, and I think for me, those are the three big mistakes, just knowing who you are staying on top of everything and also just understanding your business model very well. So that, that the reason why I say that is because once you understand your business model, you kind of know what is worth spending much time on, what is worth avoiding, what is worth um, spending more time on, um, where should I get more people into the business, um, those kind of things. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was very well said. Uh, there was a lot of really valuable uh, pieces of guidance and information in that short, uh, I don't want to call it a rant, but rant that you did there. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I really like agree with you 100% on those like self awareness, like I feel like most people think they know themselves. Uh, and then they go and they do something like this, where they have to work with a, a small team and, and do different stuff. And like, it's like, you're always learning more about yourself. And um, mm-hmm. I, it's like you just end up surprising yourself with uh, new things you find out. Yeah. Um, and then one of my favorite quotes about the second one that you said, um, where you uh, you mentioned that you have to kind of grow all businesses at the same rate and uh, balance everything out. Uh, one of my favorite things is, is like a lot of people focus so much on like trying to push the product and they don't uh, actually work on developing a quality product. So like one of my favorite quotes is that like really good or really like heavy marketing uh, it either helps you sell your product or it just helps you reveal how bad your product is. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like one of my favorite quotes. And I thought that fit well with uh, your uh, little um, guidance that you gave there. Yeah. Um, so here's my, my last question before the fast five. Um, so if there's somebody listening and they, they want to create a business based on a game, uh, whether that's a board game or a card game or maybe even a video game, um, what piece of like actionable advice would you give them? Um, so I think it's understanding what you're selling. And that's that sounds very simple, but it's not because a lot of people think that you're selling a game, but what you're selling is an experience. So like just to kind of refer to, you said you played Exploding Kittens like a few weeks ago. The experience there is what you're buying. So you're buying the opportunity to kind of, you know, have this the drama field, um kind of atmosphere when you're playing a game and some people buy games because they like the strategic thinking a bit behind it like making me think too much or like making my brain work a little bit more than others and makes me excited whatever whatever that's an experience and so when you're making a game you need to understand what's the experience you're trying to create so once you understand that element um you're able to really uh, be better than most people because most people are not aware of the experience they're trying to, you know, get out. And also helps you know your market a little bit better. Um, so I'll say just figure that out and take time understanding that and you'll be you'll be good to go. Um, the rest, you know, you can always um, look at YouTube and other people and learn from them how they develop their games and you'll be fine. Yeah, I, I really like that piece of advice. I think that'll help a lot of people that are that are trying to do a new new venture around a game. Um, so now for the fast five, uh, sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's not, but we call it fast (laughs) five. Um, so what's the most valuable learning experience that you've had in general? 
Uh, I think uh, I would say teaching um, children in an NGO. Um, yeah, I learned I learned a lot about um, you know what you can teach people and what you can learn from them and um, what it takes to build a community um, and also the, the the need for helping out in society. So that was a very um, good experience for me. Very cool. Um, what is one book that you would recommend? Uh, it's called The Ride of a Lifetime by um, Robert Iger. I believe that's how you say his name. So he was the CEO of uh, Disney for 15 years and he wrote a lot about how he was able to build the business and save it because it was really about to go down. Um, so that's an interesting book. I would recommend anyone in the creative industry, um, creative entrepreneur, if you will. It's a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. That one I haven't had recommended before. So that's awesome. I mean, with 50, 50 episodes, you get a lot of repeats. So I love it when there's a new new book that hasn't been mentioned before. Uh-huh. So, yeah. <laughs> um, what is one uh, business related tool that you would recommend? Um, just one. All right. I'll- I mean, as many as you want to list off, but. <laughs> Uh, what's like the most important ones that you you think um i think i would say instagram instagram is definitely up there instagram gives an opportunity to uh market in a new way and get to a lot of people and you know so it just depends on how well you can use it yeah yes (laughs) That's a, that's a very good point. Knowing what you can do, knowing what you're good at will help you figure out what works best for you. Um, how do you go about like scheduling your time and planning ahead for things? Um, so I have this, I don't know if it's a gift, but I'll just call it the gift for now. I'm always thinking of what's the worst that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I always think about that and then I kind of see what I need to do ahead of time and kind of give myself some room for error. Like I said, I've, I, you know, a lot of things I do are very creative based. So I always end up failing most times before I succeed. So I give myself enough room to fail, um, which is a different way most people think about things, but that's just how I, I view things. Um, and then obviously I use the simple, you know, outlook to schedule my calendar. And um, I also like to give myself just a few goals I can do maybe during the day, if I can, maybe I'll have like three things to accomplish within, within the day. And I also kind of work in like a clock in clock out system. So for instance, if I'm on my desk, I'll probably time myself and work for two hours. After that, I'll just leave and never come back at the office until, you know, until I have to come back. <laughs> yeah, that I like, I actually kind of like that. That's a really, really kind of cool, cool concept because sometimes I'll be kind of sitting down here in, in my office room and uh, I'll be down here and I won't actually be working on stuff and I'll be at my desk, like where I normally work on stuff. And I'll be down here for like two, two and a half hours or whatever. And like, I really like only worked for 30 minutes, but I feel like if I like push the button and like I'm working now, like it would actually help me stay, stay more focused. Yeah, I, That's an interesting, it really problem. helps. And also kind of, gives you room to kind of go refreshing up and kind of come back think about it like uh how like in in university you probably have like an hour max and you have to walk out and go to another room or something that kind of helps you refresh and you know wake up again or whatever so yeah yeah i like that and uh the last uh, question of the fast five what is the number one thing that drives your motivation um so for me i think I just, I've always believed that um, to whom much is given, much is expected. Um, however, that may look like in, in anyone's life. Um, there's always someone out there who um, uh, would probably, let's, I would say, wish to have what you have in, in a sense. Um, so, you know, I think waking up with just being really grateful for what you have is a really good start for motivation. But then, now I'm thinking ahead and kind of saying, okay, what can I do with the little time I have in this world? Um, what what kind of value can I create? However, that may look like for anyone. It can be just maybe impacting maybe your friend or your if you have a child, your son or something, but it can also just be impacting someone else through what you put out there in the world. Um, so what really drives me is that opportunity to just 
really be grateful for what I have and also be able to help someone out of, you know, whatever way that that may be. Um, yeah. Very well said. Very well said. I like, I like that. Um, so now, uh, before we, uh, before I ask the last question here, um, I want to make sure that we give it the opportunity to, to share where we can find more about your game. Mucho. Sweet. Um, so the most active, uh, social media account to have right now is our Instagram. That is, uh, mucho. So M U C O dot game. And then we also have a Facebook account, a Facebook page, which is also Mucho Game. You can find us there. Um, we also have a LinkedIn account. So we have all of that. And if you go to our Instagram, we have like a, in our bio, we have a link that shows our own personal website. If anyone wants to check out our website. Um, but um, all in all, we're just, we, we're, we're pretty much in all those different areas. And I think the biggest thing is you can find us there and kind of see what we're doing as we look forward to our, august 1st um published date so um yeah hope to see you guys on our social medias yeah if you're listening right now make sure to go give them a follow on instagram mucho.game um i'm excited man i'm excited to see your game come into uh fruition and uh hopefully get my hands on it (laughs) (laughs) um all right so last question here uh shama it was uh it was great having you on the podcast and last question um, I'll just have you provide one main takeaway that you want everybody that's listening to walk away, pondering, thinking about. Oh, thinking about. Oh, um, hmm. that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a lot of pressure. But um, is there one thing that you talked about today that you thought like you want to just kind of emphasize once more before we end? Um, I think it's just more of like thinking about um, what drives you. That's really I like that question because mm-hmm. it really it's a deep question. I, I think I'll just uh, advise everyone to think about that deeply, like what what really drives you in life, and I hope that everyone can really find it because it will make them um, a really it'll make, it'll make them better people and they'll be able to impact society in a bigger yeah. way. So I think it's more like a challenge. Think about it deeply. Um, what really drives you, um, and I hope that you find it. Absolutely, and don't stop thinking about it once you yeah. figure it out. <laughs> Yep. (laughs) Well, uh, this was great. I really enjoyed having you on the podcast. Thank you so much, man. Of course. And all right. I am really glad I was able to share Shama's story with you guys. Thanks again for being on the show, Shama. And thank you to everyone listening right now. I truly appreciate your support in this journey. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you want to hear more amazing entrepreneurial stories and advice, I encourage you to go check out studentbuiltstartups.com as well as mucho.game on all social medias. Thanks again, and I will catch you on the next episode.